I was looking at the, the setup here tonight, and Pastor Austin reminded me something I said this afternoon he thought was funny. I'd, I'd, uh, my mom, we'd put her into a facility a while back, and, and uh, they'd go to the hairdresser every now and then, and she usually had long, straight hair, but they'd given her this curly perm, and it was just stark white, curly perm, and we took a picture, and she's got this fuzzy thing on top, and standing next to each other, it looks like our heads are just reversed. And I said, if I turn my head upside down, I look just like my mom. <laughs> now, the, re the reason I say that, I thought of that because looking at the, the sanctuary here, I thought if I could just, like, turn the whole thing around here, then everybody would be at the front, okay? Because we're kind of back there. Now, I can't complain about that because I'm, I'm a, more of a back row type of person. I like to sit and kind of could take it all in there from that perspective. So I got no complaint there as long as you're with me. And um, so let's get into the Word. I've been, yeah, let me see here. I've got to wake my thing from its slumber here. All right, there we go. Having been in ministry for uh, almost half my life, I realize that even Christians can tend to place an uh, unwarranted level of esteem on uh, uh, eloquent and articulate uh, and if I dare say, entertaining speakers. And I've preached or uh, taught here on many occasions, and it's been quite a while, though, since I preached. So the temptation as the uh, uh, message for the first time on staff is to, uh, honestly, to try to break out something that's just going to uh, impress you and engage and be exciting and, and everything else. And uh, I do hope that whenever I speak, you expect that I'm going to bring a worthwhile word from the Lord. But I'm resisting that temptation here tonight because uh, the word that the Lord, I, I believe, gave me on the way home the other night um, is pretty straightforward. It's not going to be flashy. In fact, uh, I went home and told my wife I'd be speaking on, on uh, tonight, and, and she said, well, what are you going to be talking about? And I said, well, I'm not quite sure yet, but here's kind of what I'm thinking. And so uh, I gave her just not even really the outline, just the main points. And I expected her to say, well, man, that, that, that sounds good. I think that's really what we need to hear. I'm looking forward to it. And um, instead, you know what she said? She said, well, that doesn't sound too exciting. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks, dear, for that uh, word of encouragement, that great boost of my confidence. If that doesn't do it, I don't know what will. But I know she's, uh, you know, she's, um, you know, just, uh, she's heard me preach and teach a lot of times, and she knows I can bring it if I have to. But I think she's just probably trying to, to guard and make sure that my first outing uh, here in the pulpit's not a, a snoozer. And so if you feel so inclined to doze off, just don't let my wife see you because uh, she's going to tell me I told you so. Because so. I decided to go and I felt well, what, the, what the Lord gave me tonight. So uh, I'm not uh, expecting or intending to impress anyone with what I do. There's going to be room down the road for some more uh, illustrative and dynamic messages, I'm sure. But tonight I want to uh, bring a simple word on what's probably a pretty common theme, although I think it's, it's probably, if nothing else, it's an, it's an under-applied topic. And, and uh, that's what I want to talk about uh, tonight, because um, I believe that, uh, that God has something for us, especially the Sunday night crowd. And I don't know, how many of you grew up attending Sunday night church? I remember... Um, uh, Sunday nights as a kid, and when the message is over, we just, we just came forward to pray. Usually it was unsolicited. Sometimes you came forward and prayed yourself, and other times it was with family, and, and sometimes you might have had a, a deep need, and other times it was, it was just there uh, waiting on God. But uh, I remember those times. And I still think that a Sunday night crowd is probably made up of those who are uh, ready to go deeper and who are engaged in the spiritual battle that usually characterizes uh, uh, godly prayer. And so tonight, that's, uh, that's really what I want to talk about. And, um, and uh, uh, let me ask you before we get underway this question. How many of you have been praying for quite some time, maybe a, a good length of time for something in particular, maybe something or someone, and you haven't seen the answer yet, but you've been praying for that, a lot of people here. I believe this is for you tonight. Because um, God has given me a message. I simply, I'm simply titling it Persistent Prayer. Persistent Prayer. Now, speaking of persistent, how many of you parents 
uh, your kids grow. How many of you had a, a, a strong-willed or persistent child? Anybody have one of those? You may recall a time when maybe uh, you went to the grocery store or the mall or, uh, God forbid, a toy store uh, or wherever, maybe a restaurant, but somewhere where your kid was determined to get something that you were determined not to let them have. Anybody been there before? Now, maybe you can relate to this story that I found by Paul Harvey. Anybody ever remember listening to Paul Harvey on the radio? All right. Good day. All right, that's Paul Harvey. Well, he told the story of a three-year-old boy who went to the grocery store with his mother. And uh, before they entered the store, she said to him, Now, uh, you're not going to get any chocolate chip cookies, so don't even bother asking. Well, they got in the store, and she put him in the car. He sat down in the, in the child's seat, and they uh, went on their way. And ev- everything was going pretty well until they came to the cookie section. And the little boy, he just saw those, and man, he just couldn't resist. He got out of the chair, and he stood up and said, Mom, can I have some chocolate chip cookies? And she said, I told you before we got in here, you're, not get, you're definitely not getting anything now. So he sat down kind of discouraged, and they went on their way, and they're wheeling back and forth down the aisles. And in the process of trying to find all the things they were looking for, they ended up, you guessed it, back in the cookie aisle. Mom, can I please have some chocolate chip cookies? She said, I told you already you're not getting anything. Now sit down and be quiet. Well, as they approached the checkout counter, the, the boy thought this is, this is his last chance. So man, he got up, he got out of a chair, he wiggled out of there, he put his arm up in the air and said, in the name of Jesus, can I please have some chocolate chip cookies? Well, that got the attention of everybody in the store, and they had a good laugh, and uh, and even a few applause, and due to the uh, empathy and generosity of all the other shoppers, the mother and her boy left with 23 boxes of <laughs> chocolate chip cookies. Paul Harvey, good day. All right. Well, I don't uh, recommend that kind of persistence because that's usually not the kind that gets rewarded. At least it wasn't in my household as a kid or as a parent. But as children of God, God invites us to be persistent and not presumptuous, not demanding, but to persevere, particularly when it comes to prayer. And that's what I'm going to challenge you with tonight about things that might be weighing on your mind right now and probably have been for some time. So the first principle I want to highlight is simply this. Be proactive in prayer. Be proactive in prayer. And you can turn to Ezekiel chapter 22 if you have your Bibles. It'll be up on the screen as well. But I won't go into the details about the circumstances here, but suffice it to say that God's people had wandered so far from him and become so corrupt that there was no one of that day outside of the prophet Jeremiah who was uh, willing to stand against evil, let alone lead the people back to God. And to the point where God himself had to say, and he's the one speaking here in Ezekiel 22, 30, and he said, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land. So I would not have to destroy it. But I found no one. That's a sad statement. There wasn't one person to be found who would build up that wall. And it's not like the current political debate now. Do we build the wall? Do we don't build the wall? The wall that he was talking about would be built up not in a physical way, but in a spiritual way. And it would happen through prayer. So what I'm aiming at tonight is to encourage those of you who are already standing in the gap for others, particularly those who may be facing uh, some sort of spiritual crisis because uh, they lack a personal relationship with God. Or maybe uh, it's not a matter of salvation, but some other uh, need or concern that they need someone to stand in the gap for them and call on God to intervene. Because that's not a time to hesitate. It's not a time to procrastinate when lives are hanging In the balance. In fact, speaking of hesitation, it kind of makes me think. Have you ever been uh, sitting at a stoplight and um, and you're there and you're ready to go and the light changes and the person in the front of the line is just completely distracted and he's there uh, looking all around somewhere, eating a sandwich, uh, picking his nose, uh, texting, whatever, and he's not ready to go. Have you ever found yourself? And maybe you've been the one doing that. Maybe your spouse has turned to you and said, "What are you waiting for?" A written invitation? You ever hear that one? Well, God gives us and has given us a written invitation. 
when it comes to prayer. So I challenge you tonight, don't give up. God hears your prayers and answers are on the way. It may not be how you expect. It may not be in your way and time. But God wants us to stay proactive in prayer. He wants us to take the initiative. He wants us to be proactive. But more than that, he wants us to be patient in prayer. Patient in prayer. Daniel chapter 10, if you want to flip over there. And we'll get there in a second. But when it comes to spiritual matters, we cannot overemphasize uh, the need and importance for patience. Because not only is patience a fruit of the Spirit, but uh, patience is vital when it comes to prayer because the answers usually come through a process. And the process is is usually an intense one. In fact, the Bible often refers to it as a spiritual battle. And that's because there are very real forces at work for us and against us. And the conflict is waging behind the scenes long before we ever see the answer or before the victory is won. Case in point, I want you to consider one of the boldest, most insightful prophets in the Old Testament. Someone who understood the importance of prayer. In fact, that's what set him at odds with the culture of his day. And his name is Daniel. That's his book. And you remember the lion's den instance? He ended up in the lion's den because he refused to stop praying. But he also uh, escaped it and lived through it because he was a person who understand how to get a hold of God. He knew how to pray effectively. But one instance recorded in the book of Daniel highlights the importance of being patient in prayer because there are things that are going on behind the scenes that we're not aware of. And the challenge for us is to be patient and to press through because the answer that you're looking for may already be on the way. And in Daniel chapter 10, I'm not going to read or go into the whole passage, but Daniel describes a vision he had uh, regarding what it says is a great war. But the real war was not going on in an earthly sense. The real battle was a spiritual one. And in the vision, uh, it says that there was an awesome heavenly being. And, and, and it describes, he describes to Daniel the opposition that he faced from a demonic power and how he needed help from Michael, one of God's chief angels, uh, in, in order to overcome that opposition. But right prior to that, in, in verse 2 of, uh, of that book, uh, of that chapter, it talks about how Daniel had been praying and fasting uh, intensely and incessantly for three weeks. In fact, it says he didn't eat or drink anything. He didn't use any lotions. He didn't, he didn't uh, get ready for anything. He was praying that whole time. And probably most of it, he wondered if his prayers were having any effect at all. But the angel revealed that during that time, there was an intense battle raging in the spiritual realm, and that was preventing an immediate answer. Oh, it says that the answer uh, was on its way the moment Daniel began that battle in prayer, but it wasn't realized till the battle had played out in the spiritual realm. And it goes on to say uh, in, in chapter 10, verse 12, it says, Then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom, now he's talking about a demonic force. You know, the Bible talks about uh, principalities and powers in and, and, and heavenly places. He's talking about uh, a demonic power. He resisted me for 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief priests, he's talking about Michael, the archangel, Michael and Gabriel. He said, Michael came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. And now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future. For this vision concerns a time yet to come. He had come there with the answer, but it had been a long time in coming. Now, this is one of the passages in the Bible, one of the few, where the curtain is pulled back. And we get a glimpse of the unseen things going on in the spiritual realm. Another one of those uh, passages, be kind of looking behind the scenes, is, is remember uh, when Elisha had a servant who was, who was terrified because there were enemy forces on all the hills surrounding the city, ready to, to besiege the city. And, the, and, and his servant was, was petrified. And Elisha prayed that God would reveal to a ser- servant what was really going on behind the scenes. And when the Lord opened his eyes, he looked, and the hillside all surrounding the city was full of fiery horses and flaming chariots. These were the unseen forces of God, poised and ready to demolish the enemy. That's what's going on beyond the sea. Now, in Daniel's situation here, or, or for any situation uh, for that matter, God could have intervened and, and overruled the opposition instantly. But instead, he chose to work through a person and work through their faith. That's why Satan works so hard to keep us from praying. 
And when we do pray, he tries to distract us and tries to discourage us when it seems that the answers are, are nowhere in sight. And that's why persistent prayer is crucial because that's how we wage the war and that's how we win spiritual battles. Ephesians chapter 6, a passage you probably well know, it talks about the spiritual armor and again likens things to a battle. And it talks about putting on the full armor of God so we can stand against Satan's schemes. And then it goes on to describe each individual piece of the armor. And, and then at the end of that, the, the offensive weapon we have, which is the, the sword of the Spirit and the Word of God. But in verse number 18, kind of to wrap up that whole passage after he tells you, put on this armor, then he says this. He says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, keep on praying. Because that's how we engage in the spiritual battle. You see, the armor is for the battle, but prayer is the battle. That's the way spiritual forces uh, are engaged. It's through prayer. And while there are demonic forces that are, that are aligned against us, and there are infinitely more powerful forces that are on our side. But those forces await deployment, which God defers to our initiative through prayer. In fact, Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter 14 says that angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. Do you realize that when you pray, there are angels at your beck and call? There are spiritual forces in heavenly realms who are ready to be deployed into battle to do God's will on your behalf. But before they engage, they wait for the call. A call that comes through prayer. Ephesians 6, 12 came before talking about the armor. That's the passage that says our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not a physical one. It's not something we can see. But it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's, that's, that's what he was describing to Daniel. The same thing. That's what's going on. And you see, there are things going on in the spiritual realm, unbeknownst to us, that if we aren't careful, we get discouraged thinking nothing is happening, and we don't realize the answer is already on its way. And I'm here to tell you tonight that there are things that will happen because of prayer that will never happen apart from prayer. And make no mistake about it, God can do anything he chooses. And his purposes are going to be accomplished one way or the other. But he desires to partner with us. And you can be assured that the Lord is the one who's going to fight your battles. And he's going to give you just what you need. But as that battle rages in the heavenly, heavenly realms, and we look around, and we don't see the answer anywhere inside. In fact, from your standpoint, it, it may feel like God's not hearing your prayers at all. But I want to tell you tonight, keep on persisting. Keep on praying. Be proactive in prayer, be patient in prayer, and number three, be persistent in prayer. Turn over to Luke chapter 18. I'm going to look at one of Jesus' parables there. Now, persistence uh, is directly related to patience, but persistence kind of uh, takes things up a notch. It's, it's more than just kind of, uh, you know, uh, holding your place or holding your peace. Persistent uh, implies pushing forward. In fact, I like to uh, define persistence as, as active patience. It's kind of a, a, a work while you wait mentality. And that's what God has wants to have because a prayer is hard work. That's why it's a lot easier to talk about it. That's why it's easier to preach about it than it is to actually do it on a consistent basis. And so in Luke chapter 18, it says that Jesus told this parable to his disciples to show them that they should always pray and not give up. And he said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea. She said, grant me justice against my adversary. And for some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice. So she won't eventually come and attack me or to, or to come and wear me out with all, her, with all her begging. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust just says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice, and quickly. However, now notice this last part. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? There are people that would have you to believe that praying over and over for the same thing shows a lack of faith. But this passage right here makes it un unmistakably clear that persistent prayer uh, is in fact the demonstration of faith. In fact, it's the kind of faith that Jesus will be looking for in the last days, but is going to find less and less. 
So if you want your faith to endure the end times, be persistent in prayer. Because God is more willing and reliable than anyone else to respond to your pleas for help. You see, persistent prayer isn't a matter of, of begging God for things. It's not a matter of having to keep him apprised of the situation because he's well aware of what's going on. He's well aware of your needs even before you ask. But he's always prepared to do what's best for us. And persistent prayer uh, isn't a matter of, of overcoming uh, God's reluctance. In fact, it's really a matter of, of laying hold of his highest willingness it's not a matter of, of trying to co convince God uh, to do what we desire. Prayer is a time that we come and, and we come into alignment with what God desires. Matthew chapter 16 and then again in verse 18, Jesus says this regarding the church. He says that whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, he's not saying that we're establishing or dictating uh, some new order of things on our own. In, in fact, if you go back and look at the original tense and the languages there, what it's really saying is what we bind and loose on earth will have already been bound and loosed in heaven. In other words, the solution has been established. God's, uh, God's plans are already in, in effect and in place, and we're not acting, uh, enacting anything of our own volition. We simply recognize what God wants to do, what he may be already doing, what he, what he intends to do, maybe what he's already done. We simply come into alignment with that through our time in prayer. And that's the primary reason and the primary way that we exercise our faith and the authority God's given us by being persistent in our prayer. That's why Jesus concludes that parable by asking, is, is that kind of faith even going to be evident in the last days? Because it's a matter of persistence. Jesus is really warning us that in the last days, the enemy's uh, best strategy is going to simply be to wear down our faith and try to distract us with, the, with all the cares, with, with all the allures of this life, and, 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 and try to get us to, to give up living for him and following his word. Uh, in fact, th th what he's basically going to do is just try to keep you from praying. He's going to have you look around and see, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening in my own life. It's not happening with my family. Uh, it's not happening in my circle of influence. What's happening in, in society? The thing, what's happening with our prayers? And he just wants you to give up. Because in the days before Jesus returns, even some of us who've been faithful in prayer, who stood in that gap, who've been proactive, who've been calling on God, it's going to be tough to persist. It's going to be easy to lose heart when we don't see the prayers being answered. But I want you to keep praying. Keep praying proactively. Keep praying patiently. Keep praying persistently. And tonight as we prepare to come to these altars to pray, I want to challenge you to pray purposefully. Be purposeful in your prayers. In the book of Job, you can turn there just quickly. I want to consider one last example. But be purposeful in prayer. Pray with the sense that something is happening. You may not see the evidence of, for 21 days like Dan. You may not see evidence for 21 years. But God says keep going. Keep praying because no matter what you see at the moment, my purposes are going to be accomplished as you keep depending on me. We started reading in Ezekiel about standing in the gap and building the wall. Or as some translate it, building up that, uh, a hedge of protection around someone else. But in Ezekiel's time, there was nobody found to build that hedge or build that wall. So I want to ask you, what about today? Will Jesus find here the faith that he's looking for? As we get ready for a time of intercession, which is, which is simply praying for others, coming and standing in on behalf of others, I want to remind you of a godly individual who was willing to stand in the gap, who was willing to build up a wall that even Satan himself couldn't breach, and there was no temptation, there was no accusation, there was nothing uh, in his entire demonic arsenal that was able to destroy the wall surrounding Job's life. But Job's faith was put to the test. And you see right out there at the beginning of the book of Job, there was a man uh, who lived in us whose, whose name was Job, and he was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. Had seven sons, three daughters, 7,000 sheep, and on and on, all the stuff he had. It said he was the greatest man among the people of the East. And then it kind of goes on to, to describe something we might have skipped over at the beginning of Job, and it talks about his sons would, would hold these feasts and invite their sisters and all the families and other people, and, and they would come and, and party and so forth. And after uh, that time was done, it, it, it says that Job uh, made arrangements for them to be purified. So Job said, you know, just in case 
in the midst of all this, that, and maybe they did something that wasn't quite right. Maybe just in their thoughts they had, they had cursed God or, or had something impure in their life. Just by chance of that, it said that Job came, and early in the morning he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's, it says, his regular custom. Well, then it goes on to the part we usually pick up with, and when the, when the angels come before God, and Satan came with them, and, and God said, have you considered my servant Job? He's blameless and upright, and all these things. And, and, and the devil says, in verse number 9 of Job 1, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? Now I want to ask you, had, had God really given Job some special advantage to insulate him from, from difficulty? No, he didn't do that. But I'm going to tell you this, there was something there. There was something real enough that the devil himself recognized and couldn't pre- penetrate. And, and I had to wonder what it was and how it got there. And then I look back at verse 5, and it talks about Job offering up those petitions uh, for his sons and daughters and doing this on a continual basis. And I see that that hedge of protection, that, that fort- fortress of faith, that barricade was built up through Job's petitions that he continually offered up for his family. That's how it got there. Now perhaps you've been praying for somebody in your family. Perhaps it's a a child who's wandered from God, or maybe a parent who doesn't relate at all to your faith, or, or maybe a grandkid who's never known the security of a relationship with God. Perhaps you know someone else who's struggling or 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 suffering or searching for answers that they haven't found. And You've taken the initiative to stand in the gap for them and to call on God, but it's been hard to persist because you really haven't seen any answers to that prayer. And I want to challenge you tonight, don't give up, because the battle is the Lord's. He knows the situation, he has it under control, but he's teaming with you, giving you the privilege, giving you authority to commission the forces of heaven to work his will through your prayers. So I want you to stand with me as we prepare tonight to petition God. And as we do, I want you, above all, to be prepared for God to answer your prayers. Be prepared for God to answer your prayers. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says this. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be open. For which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Or you then, if you then know, being evil, how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? I want to encourage you tonight, if your heart is toward God, he'll work through your prayers to accomplish his purposes. And his will in your life is going to be done. It's going to be done in those for whom you've been willing to stand in the gap and build up that hedge and to build up that wall. And it may not be something you'll see for 21 hours, may not come in 21 days, may not come in 21 months or 21 years. Some of you have probably been praying that long for some things. But God is telling you tonight, keep waging that war. Keep holding the faith because he's ultimately going to honor that faith. So tonight, we're going to exercise our faith once again, maybe in the same issues that you brought to God over and over, but he's saying, press on. I've heard your prayers, and the answer is on the way. So I'm going to ask, if you've got a need tonight, I'm going to ask you to come once again for that thing, and I want you to persist in that prayer. Don't think and don't let the enemy tell you that somehow it's a lack of faith for you to persist. God says, keep asking. And no sense in worrying about it over and over. If it's on your mind, you might as well bring it to God. You might as well take it to him and acknowledge, God, it's yours. You've got to do something in this situation. I surely can't do it, or it would have been done already. And if that's you tonight and you have a, a need in your life, I'm going to ask that in just a few moments, if you want to come down, if you want to be anointed with oil, and oil is simply a, a symbol of the Holy Spirit, that we're asking God to come upon you and do a work that only you, you can, that he can do. And if that's you tonight and you want prayer in that way, I'm just going to ask that you come and that you'll stand. And pastors and others may come, and we're going to anoint you with oil and pray. There may be others that you just want to come and you just want to find a place. I encourage you to take the step out. Find that place in an altar. There's something about stepping out to that place of encounter with God. But, but if you do, you want to find a place where you're at, that's fine. You may just want to turn and kneel. But I'm challenging you tonight.
to take that issue that you may have brought to God time and time and time again. You haven't seen the answer. But tonight, we're going to be proactive. We're going to be patient. We're going to persist in prayer. And I believe that we're going to see God answer these prayers because we've been faithful. You don't know what's going on in the spiritual realm. Daniel had no idea. He persisted. God won that battle for him. There are battles going on, man. There are battles for some of you who have unsaved loved ones. You can't imagine what's going on in the spiritual realm trying to prevent that from happening. And God's saying, don't give up because he's partnering with us to do it. Yeah, he could do it on his own. But God is saying, I'm giving you that power and authority. And I'm working as you commission those forces. And they're ready and waiting for somebody to call on me. And that's all it takes. And he sends them out. And they're ready to do God's building. But it's going to take work. It's going to take persistence. It's going to take diligence. So if that's you tonight, and you have a need uh, on your heart, and maybe it's for you, but if it's for someone else in particular, particularly those who maybe who don't know the Lord you've been praying for, I want to invite you to come once again. And if you want to be anointed with prayer, just come at this altar and stand. And we're going to come and we're going to meet you. For the rest of you, I just invite you right now to come. The worship team is not going to sing anything that's familiar to you right away because I think that can distract you. You'll go right back to singing. I want this to be a place of prayer. And as we linger, we may go back to that worship time. But I want to invite you right now to come, to find a place, to bring your need to God, and to persist in prayer, and to believe that God is going to honor that act of faith. And he's going to do something that only he can do. And if you want to be anointed, just come down and stand across the front. And we're going to join with you. And we're going to agree with you that God is going to do what only he can do.